Not sure what I got going on here now. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, chemical reactions, part B, 310303DB. Everyone can see that, I hope. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Objectives today, I'm uh, going to look at uh, describing the electrical properties of water solutions. So this takes us back a little bit to uh, relations with the liquid analyzer uh, portion of the course as well. So a lot of the objectives that we're looking at today uh, kind of reflect some of the material that we've covered previously in analyzers. Uh, if you didn't quite get it all then, uh, this should help clarify things a little bit for you. Uh, we don't address too much new stuff in this ILM. Um, defining pH, hydrogen ion concentration, and ionic activity, um, acids and bases on the pH scale, um, all of that stuff we've looked at before. Acid-based titration, we haven't really looked at, but this is a, a small component in the ILM. Then uh, describing oxidation and reduction in a reaction. So we have hit on the subject of oxidation and reduction in a previous IOM. Uh, this time we're going to look at it in terms of, of reactions. Um, so we're going to look at some of these oxidation numbers we talked about earlier and how, to, how, they, how they work out in a, in a chemical reaction. And there's a little bit of uh, flanagling uh, going on in that little section there that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, but hopefully we can uh, make a pretty clear demonstration for you on how to figure that part of it out. And then the last objective is uh, describing electrochemical cells. So this gives us a background, uh, I guess, chemistry-wise to the sensors that we talk about in liquid analyzers. So uh, lots of tie-ins uh, in this ILM with the uh, analyzer, liquid analyzer section. Okay, so this module is designed to provide relevant information related to the operating principles of many analytical instruments that we work with in the field. Uh, pH, ORP, and conductivity specifically uh, in this ILM that we talk about that are very big in the water industry. Um, acids and bases in water treatment situations, boiler feed water and other things like that. And then the last section again talks about oxidation and reduction uh, in sensors and batteries. And we've, we've talked about how the sensors uh, use the, the concentration or presence of certain ions in order to be able to complete a circuit. Uh, and this kind of just explains that a little bit more uh, in a different perspective. So we'll start out with the electrical properties of water solutions, um, kind of dealing with conductivity. Conductivity, of course, is the water's ability to conduct electricity. Um, we should know probably uh, from some middle school type science experiments that pure water uh, is not a very good conductor or does not conduct. But if we add acids or bases or salts to water, uh, it becomes conductive. And uh, most of us have probably done a science experiment, you know, with uh, a glass of water and a light bulb and a battery and then, and then salt water to kind of prove that, that theory there as well. Um, but what's happening here when we're adding acids, bases, or salts to it, these are all uh, ionic compounds. So when we add them to water, we're contributing ions. And of course, uh, the ions are what uh, create the current or voltage uh, that provide um, the, the energy for our measurement signals. Uh, electrolytes, and this is just some general uh, terminology here, electrolyte uh, is a substance that conducts electricity in an aqueous or water solution. Uh, adding salt to pure water makes it an electrolyte. And we'll talk about different types of electrolytes in the next couple of slides. Electrodes are the conductors uh, through which current enters or leaves an electrolyte. Uh, positive ions, as we see in this diagram here, go to the negative electrode, and the negative ions are attracted to the positive electrode. And just to reconfirm one more time that water uh, by itself in its purest uh, form, we call a non-electrolyte, but we'll elaborate on that a little bit. Okay, so we classify uh, these electrolytes, as I was saying, we're going to elaborate a little bit. So we start out with an aqueous solution again, which is something dissolved in, in water. 
And then we can go further from there to say, well, it's either a non-electrolyte, which means it does not conduct, or if it does conduct, it becomes an electrolyte. Um, we're going to go from this side here mostly because we're concerned with uh, what happens in these sensors and the, and the solutions that they're in. Um, so these electrolytes then are either classified as a weak electrolyte, which is characterized by uh, weak conductivity, or a strong electrolyte, which is characterized by strong conductivity. So we're going to look at three major classifications, strong, weak, and non, as we see here. Okay, strong electrolytes are strong for a certain reason, and the reason uh, that they are strong is, again, because they are ionic compounds that completely disassociate, and that's a fancy word we're going to learn today, uh, when dissolved in water, and they are great conductors, and, and we see in the uh, examples here, hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, uh, and salt all in uh, aqueous solutions, so means, meaning in water. If we deconstruct these, um, they ultimately turn into a hydronium ion and a chloride ion or this ion or that ion or this ion or that ion. And they are all individual. The hydronium is by itself, the chloride is by itself, the sodium, the hydroxide, this, this sodium, this chlorine, they're, they're completely separate from each other. And this is what we call disassociated. And, and that frees up a lot of ions, and that's why we get good conductivity or a strong electrolyte. Weak electrolytes, on the other hand, do not fully disassociate in water, and I'll show you in the examples what that means. A um, couple ways you can tell. First is that uh, incomplete disassociation is indicated by this double-ended uh, arrow between uh, the, this major compound, which I don't even know the name, it's some kind of a sugar, I believe, uh, and the other uh, components over here. And the fact that this hydrogen is in both of the products. I'm, I'm not sure if we technically call these products or if these are technically reactants. Uh, but when this disassociates as much as it can, it does give us uh, some hydrogen ions, but some of them stay together in this polyatomic ion. So it's not completely disassociated. Otherwise, we have separate uh, we have separate uh, divisions of the hydrogen. And, and you don't really need to know um, any more than that. Uh, we're more concerned with being able to, to define the, the categories of these electrolytes and then the understanding the basic idea of what's going on here. And we're just trying to make more uh, ions available. Okay, non-electrolytes, again, here will not conduct electricity when dissolved in water. They don't break down into ions. Uh, they are generally covalent substances like sugar or ethyl alcohol, uh, basically uncharged molecules in water. And uh, here's that little picture of our middle school science experiment uh, where we have a light bulb and some uh, electrodes in uh, a strong electrolyte and then versus a non-electrolyte where there's no conduction. Okay, so conductivity uh, and electrolytes, again, we said earlier, we said earlier so many times now it's a little bit too much that water is a non-electrolyte. Truth is and it is a very, very weak electrolyte uh, made up mostly of water with traces of often disassociating and reassociating uh, hydro hydroxide or hydronium and hydroxide ions. And we've seen some videos uh, or, or we're going to see, I don't know, um, somewhere in the course content, there's videos that talks about uh, how water is made up of H2O and it's continuously breaking apart and reforming again. And in the process, it's liberating some of these and, and so on and so forth. But the rest of that is kind of above our pay grade. Uh, but the idea here is that a strong electrolyte, again, has many ions and a weak electrolyte has fewer. So here's a strong electrolyte. You see plenty of ions. Uh, uh, lots of current flow on our ammeter over here, uh, weak electrolyte, fewer ions, lower current on our ammeter, and uh, non-electrolyte, of course, with no ions whatsoever and no current on our ammeter. Um, and that's, again, related to the uh, theory behind many of the electrochemical cells that are sensors uh, in analyzers that um, rely on the presence of ions and this activity to create a measurement signal. So now we're gonna move uh, specifically now into pH or the hydrogen ion concentration. I'm gonna play another video here 
uh, really quickly. And uh, I think this should probably reinforce some of the uh, theory we had in liquid analyzers as well. All right, listen up. This is the most iconic SUV in the world. It's good news. It could be yours. Yeah, the video. It's hard to see why the G-Wagon has become a symbol of luxury status and celebrity. We're working on it. So don't miss out. Click the link or go to imain.com slash win a G-Wagon and enter now for your chance to take home a Mercedes AMG G63. With oh, Texas where is it here? Word. Thanks for donating and good luck. This may come as a bit of a shock to you, but I'm not super into personal grooming. Like, I understand soap and shampoo, but there is all this other stuff now, and I keep seeing references to pH balance everywhere. pH balanced soaps and shampoos and deodorant and makeup abound in supermarkets and drugstores, and I've even seen pH balanced water. We've talked a lot about balance over the last couple of weeks, and pH balance is related to the equilibrium state of a reversible reaction. You're also probably familiar with the pH scale and you know that it has to do with acids and bases but what is pH exactly and why is it weirdly written with a lowercase p and a capital H and also what about pH's alter ego pOH the capitalization thing is probably the easiest to answer because there is no answer no one really knows what the p means the Danish chemist who came up with the term the guy with the absolutely amazing name Søren Sørensen never explained his reasoning some people think that it comes from some form of the word power whether is puissance in French or maybe Latin pondus. But it probably just came from a common habit chemists have of differentiating a test solution labeled P from a reference solution called Q. But thinking of the P as standing for power does help us remember the meaning more easily. The H part is even easier. It stands for hydrogen because hydrogen ions or protons are pivotal to the behavior of acids and bases, which is what pH describes. So you can think of pH as basically the power of hydrogen in a solution, the strength of the acid or base character of a substance. And it all revolves around one very important point of focus, our old friend water. If you've been watching Crash Course Chemistry from the beginning, you've gotten the message that water is special in more ways than I can list, and pH is just one more of those ways. We normally think of water as a perfectly neutral substance, neither acidic nor basic, and that's true. But, as I've mentioned before, water can also function as an acid, releasing hydrogen ions, also known as protons, and as a base, consuming them. How on earth is that possible? In order to explain, we first have to understand what the pH of a substance really tells us. While chemically, we say that pH represents the power of hydrogen in a solution, it's mathematically defined as the negative of the base 10 logarithm of the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. Okay, so now that you're terrified, I'm here to help. So yeah, logarithms can seem a little bit scary at first, but the ones that we're using here are super easy. And bonus, once you get familiar with them here, it'll be that much easier to understand in a math class. So now that we got the scary mathematical definition, let's do the simplest mathematical definition. At any given moment, there will be a certain number of hydrogen ions in solution, a very small number. The concentration will be a number like one times 10 to the negative fifth moles per liter. That negative five is your base 10 logarithm. Take the negative of that and you get the pH. Five. Now let's get a bit more into the weeds. The logarithm, or log, of a number is the exponent to which another number called the base must be raised to produce the target number. So for base 10 logs, the base is 10. They're what we use most in chemistry, and they're really easy to understand and also what we base scientific notation on. So as an example, the base 10 logarithm of 100 is 2, because 10 raised to the power of 2, or 10 squared, equals 100. Base 10 logs are so common that we often leave the subscript. 10 off when we write it. Like if your calculator has a log button, that's just for base 10 logs. So what in the name of Sir and Sir and Sir, does this have to do with base melting acids? Well, I'm getting to that, and it all starts with water's crazy potential to act as both an acid and a base. Random changes in the tiny electrical fields around the atoms in water occasionally cause the molecule to break apart. 
Specifically, a hydrogen ion or proton will break off from one molecule and attach itself to another one, forming a hydronium ion, H3O plus, and a hydroxide ion, OH minus. This is why water can act as both an acid and a base. Its molecules can both release and accept protons. In this case, it's only interacting with itself, but water can interact in the same way with other acids and bases. Sometimes you'll see the hydronium ion written as a simple hydrogen ion, H plus, allowing the reaction to be written with only one water molecule. It's not technically accurate, but it's close enough to reality that it can be used to simplify things. So, when we say that the pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, yeah, we actually mean hydronium ion concentration. Just another thing that early scientists got a little bit wrong and now we have to live with. Anyway, this dissociation of water is a reversible reaction, and in fact, the ions always reform into water within a tiny fraction of a second. But it's happening all the time, constantly, in your bottled water, in the water inside your cells, and in the ocean, always. However, at any given instant, only a tiny number of molecules are dissociated into ions. In fact, the exact number of these molecules is well known to chemists, it's the equilibrium constant for this reaction, and because it's such a special reaction, it has its own name, the water dissociation constant, or Kw. Kw is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th. The formula for Kw is set up like any equilibrium constant, concentrations of products over concentrations of reactants, all raised to the exponents based on the coefficients of the balanced reaction. There is, however, one difference. Because the ions represent such a tiny proportion of the total mass, the water itself is essentially pure. And pure substances, because they don't have concentrations, aren't included in equilibrium calculations. So the formula for Kw becomes simply the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide concentration. According to the balanced equation for the dissociation of water, hydronium and hydroxide are formed in a one-to-one -one ratio, so their equilibrium concentrations must be equal. That means if we call the concentration of H3O plus, for example, X, then the concentration of OH minus must equal X as well. So the formula for the dissociation constant, 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th, simplifies even further to X times X, or X squared. Suddenly, it's crazy easy. The equilibrium concentration of each ion is just the square root of 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th. Touch one key on the old calculator and hello, both concentrations equal 1.0 times 10 to the negative 7th moles per liter in equilibrium. The pH then is simply the negative log of that, which is seven. This, my friends, is the basis of the pH scale. Water is neutral, so seven is the center of the scale. And I can prove it, too. This is a strip of paper that's been infused with a chemical called litmus. Litmus is a pH indicator, a chemical that turns different colors at different pHs. There are many different indicators with many different colors, but we'll talk more about those next week. For now, just know that litmus paper turns pink in acids, blue in bases, and a sort of light purple when it's neutral. But one thing you need to remember about the pH scale, because pH is calculated from a negative logarithm, it turns everything backward. When the hydrogen ion concentrates concentration goes up, the pH gets lower. For instance, if a little acid, such as vinegar, were added to the water, the concentration of hydronium ion might rise to, say, 1.0 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter, which is a thousand times more than before. That concentration would push the pH down to four. On the other hand, a base, such as ammonia, would consume a lot of hydrogen ions if it were added to the water. If the hydrogen ion concentration drops to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 11th, a thousandth of the equilibrium concentration, the pH, will be 11. As you can see, the logs turn out to be a mathematical shorthand that saves us from dealing with very huge or very tiny numbers. The pH scale, then, is normally written from 0 to 14, with numbers below 7 representing acids and numbers above 7 representing bases. It could also go below 0 or above 14, but that only happens in super extreme cases that you are very unlikely to encounter, at least I hope. Acids like hydrochloric or nitric acid, which ionize strongly, sometimes even completely, thus releasing a lot of protons, are called strong acids because they raise the hydrogen concentration a lot. They also generally have very low pHs. Weak acids like citric acid dissociate incompletely, releasing much smaller amounts of hydrogen ion, and therefore they usually have higher pHs, generally considered to be in like the 4 to 6 range. Strong bases, meanwhile, like sodium hydroxide, consume large amounts of hydrogen ions, leaving the concentration very low, so they tend to have very high pHs. Weak bases, like sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, consume much less and generally have pHs in the 8 to 11 range. Neutral pH is technically just 7 but in a more practical sense, it's usually considered to be between 6 and 8. So if pH is based on the concentration of hydrogen, 
that is hydronium ions, what about the concentration of hydroxide ions? Just as we can calculate the pH of a substance from its hydrogen ion concentration, we can calculate the pOH, the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. This is easy because Kw never changes. Although the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide are only equal in pure water or perfectly neutral solutions, the product of the two concentrations always equals 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th in any aqueous solution. So like orange juice, which is really just an aqueous solution of sugar and citric acid and a few other things, say the hydrogen ion concentration in your OJ is 3.2 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter. Just for the fun of it, let's go ahead and calculate what the pH is at that point, which turns out to be 3.5. But we can also use the Kw and the hydronium ion concentration to do a very simple division problem and find the hydroxide concentration. It works out to 3.1 times 10 to the negative 11 moles per liter. And once we have the concentration, we can take another step. We can find the pOH of the solution, which is similar to the pH, simply the negative log of the OH concentration. The pOH, in this case, is 10.5. And now for a tip that's just more awesome and cooler than an ice cream corn dog. The sum of the pH and the pOH is always 14. In the example we just did, the pH was 5.4 and the pOH was 8.6. And yeah, you add those together, 14. Surprise! Okay, maybe that's only cool to me, but that's never stopped me before. I love this stuff. And next week, I hope to really bend your mind by showing you how to make the pH of the solution hold steady, even if you dump a strong acid or base in it. In the meantime, thank you for watching this episode of Crash Course Chemistry. If you paid attention, you learned how pure water ionizes to form hydronium and hydroxide ions in reversible reactions, and you learned about the equilibrium constant for that reaction, which has a special name, the water dissociation constant. You learned some examples of acids and bases and neutral substances, as well as why some acids and bases are called strong and others are called weak. You learned about logarithms and how you can use them to calculate the pH of a substance, and a little bit about pOH, which can be calculated with logarithms also with subtraction. And finally, you learned about some cool mathematical connections between pH and pOH. This episode was written by Edi Gonzalez and edited by Blake T. Pastino. The chemistry consultant was Dr. Heiko Langner. It was filmed, edited, and directed by Nicholas Jenkins. The script supervisor was Catherine Green. Michael Aranda is our sound designer, and our graphics team is Thought Cafe. All right, how do you like that? Snore, 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 uh, snore. He's <laughs> a funny guy. Yeah, he's a little bit more excited than we need him to be, hey? All right, so really that, that covers most of the ILM, believe it or not, that nice little video there. And I can't remember, do we already see this video in a different lecture? I'm not sure. I know that guy's in yeah. at least one of them. The previous one we have seen before, yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. All right, well, it's a good video nonetheless. All right, so uh, carrying on here. All right, so now all of this stuff that I'm about to tell you is going to be pretty boring because we just saw it all. But uh, again, pH is a negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration in moles per liter. We saw that pH is equal to the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration and that this H plus in these square brackets represents the concentration in moles per liter. This is often sometimes called the molarity as well. It's a symbol for something called molarity. Um, we learned in the video also that acids produce hydrogen ions or hydronium ions when they dissolve in water. Bases produce hydroxides when they dissolve in water. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about different definitions of this somewhere in this ILM, I believe. Um, more hydronium ions means that it's more acidic. More hydroxide ions means it's more basic. So again, pretty much regurgitating uh, what's in the video that we just watched. Uh, we've looked at the pH scale again, and he uh, said that the lower numbers are more acidic, meaning they have more hydrogen ions, and the basic ones are bigger numbers and have more hydroxide ions. The pOH we learned was also the opposite of the OH and adding them both together again uh, should equal 14 and we can do the same math and often the biggest problem when you run into questions exam questions is making sure that you read the information given to you because uh, they may give you the pH and ask you for uh, the pOH or the or vice versa and you need to know that if you can find one you can in fact find the other uh, based on this relationship down here 
Okay, um, here's some examples. We've kind of done this already. I'm not going to bore you too much with it. Uh, the very easiest one here to calculate the pH when my concentration is 10 to the negative 1 or 1 times 10 to the negative 1. Uh, and if it's uh, 1 times 10 to the negative anything, the pH is going to simply be that exponent right there. So uh, you can verify that by punching uh, into your calculator uh, the negative button, the log button. Uh, the number 10, the y to the x button, and then 1, and then the negative button, and then equal sign, and it'll pop up as a 1. If I asked you the pOH for this exact same thing based off this information, uh, you could have calculated this 1, and then you would know that the pOH is 13 because 13 plus 1 is 14, and it always must be that way. Getting a little bit more complicated here, um, calculate it when the pH uh, hydronium concentration is 1.23, so not just 1.00, so that makes it a little bit uh, a little bit trickier, so we can't just say it's this number anymore. Uh, this is where we have to punch it into the calculator, and again, uh, you can make errors by doing this wrong uh, on the calculator, so I believe the example here uh, works pretty well. You hit the log button, enter 1.23 times 10 to the 6 this way, and then press the equal sign, uh, and that should give you uh, the positive uh, the positive answer there. Third example, um, a little bit trickier again. But this is just again trying to make you understand that relationship between pH and pOH again equaling 14 all the time. So if one of them is one, the other one is obviously 13. If one is eight, the other is six, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so this is the granddaddy of all questions here. So this has uh, everything in it. We're going to give you one piece of information. And from this piece of information, you are expected to be able to drive all of the other ones based simply off of the uh, couple of uh, formulas that we have. The pH is equal to the negative log of the hydronium concentration. The pOH is equal to the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. and pOH plus pH is equal to 14. So again, not going to um, get you too crazy uh, in this demonstration or this lecture on doing this math. Um, but if you have any problems, for sure reach out to me uh, by email and we can help you out. Um, here we are, pH analyzer. Um, we talked about these in analyzers already. Measure the amount or concentration of hydronium ions and produces a voltage proportional to that concentration. Um, a different technique uh, for getting pH is based on this activity of ions, and this kind of talks to that KW thing that we saw uh, in the ILM. Uh, the good news is we don't really have to worry about that, but I just thought I would kind of throw this in here a little bit. So this slide is not really uh, too important in your future. All right, so objective three here, uh, we're now going to talk about acids and bases more specifically in terms of uh, definitions here. Um, this is what it is. Uh, two definitions exist for acids and bases, at least two that I know of and two that are mentioned in the ILM. Uh, the first of them is called the Arrhenius definition, and we've heard variations of both of these, uh, where an acid produces hydronium ions when in water. That's what we've um, we've heard this before. Uh, and this Arrhenius definition says that a base produces hydroxide ions in water, and we haven't really heard that yet, but that's just this person's definition. Um, the second definition here, the Bronsted-Lowry definition, uh, says something a little bit different as well. Uh, an acid is a substance that donates hydronium ions. So we can kind of wrap our head around that. Uh, this hydronium ion in both definitions uh, kind of makes sense to us. Uh, a base is a substance that accepts hydronium ions. So they're both saying the exact same kind of thing. Uh, neither one of these is entirely true unnecessarily in terms of some of the descriptions that we've seen. Um, they're kind of a blended combination here, but the long story short is an acid is going to have more hydronium ions, a hydroxide is going to have more, or a base is going to have more hydroxide ions, and the way that it works is by 
breaking and, and coming apart. So um, what we add to it um, will either attract these hydrox hydroniums or hydroxides or not. And that's kind of what we're going to look at uh, next. But it is important, sadly, uh, that you have to know both of these uh, definitions uh, as we see them in the ILM. This leads us into buffers. Uh, now we can relate this to the lab that we did last week. Uh, a buffer is a solution uh, designed to resist a pH change when either hydroxide or hydronium are added to it. We use these buffers to calibrate instruments, and this is what we used in the lab. Uh, there are two types of buffers, the acidic and the basic buffer, uh, buffer 10 uh, and buffer, or sorry, well, let's make it acidic uh, pH of four, or buffer four and the basic 10 uh, that we used in the lab. Uh, acidic buffers are made of weak acids and their salts. And these are just uh, facts. You don't, we're not gonna be doing any experimentation or anything on this, but this is the theory uh, behind how, um, how we can add acids or bases uh, or hydronium or hydroxide to these liquids and they don't change. And it has to do uh, with the mixture of this weak acids and their salts and the ability of the salts to absorb either the hydronium or the hydroxide ions. And it's just good background theory. Um, basic buffers are made of weak bases and their salts. So I'm not really going to expect much more of, of you than the definition and knowing that an acidic buffer is a weak acid and its salts and a basic is a weak base and their salts. Um, read through the ILM for sure and you'll get a good idea of kind of a better idea of kind of how this works. Um, but by weak, having a weak acid and or base and its associated salt in a solution and the reaction that takes place happens both ways. So the relationship or the, the solution is able to remain stable. And there's a little bit more to that, but um, that's kind of above our pay grade in, in my opinion here. Um, but the ILM does not does explain how that uh, works out there. But the long story short is uh, these buffers are important to us as uh, calibration standards. Okay, the pH scale again, probably beating a dead horse here is based on pure water. Uh, if we add more hydronium to it, it becomes acidic. If we add more hydroxide to it, it becomes more basic. All pH values are based on a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. That's important to remember uh, unless otherwise stated. And uh, here's some information you could have used earlier. We've already we've already talked about uh, this too many times here. Uh, that that matters. So I'm not going to do this again. This is all that uh, pH is half of it. The pOH is the other half, and together they're seven. Okay, here's the pH scale again, dealing with all these very small numbers and some common examples of. Uh, acidic and basic solutions or uh, mixtures. And acid-based titration. So uh, normally back in the old days uh, when we used to have in-person classes, I would line up a lab uh, on the academic side of the college in the chemistry section there when we'd work through uh, an example of what titration is. And titration is basically just using a solution of a known concentration that you have in order to neutralize uh, a solution uh, that's in question um, to find out what its pH or pOH value is. Um, and we know that if we have pOH and pH and they exist in equal amounts, if I have an acid, for example, that has an abundance of uh, hydronium in it, I can add a certain amount of base hydroxide ions to it in order to make it hit seven and become neutral. And then by measuring the amount of volume that I added to it, I can then calculate um, the acidity of the solution in question. And that's, in a nutshell, what titration uh, is all about. It's a, it's a neutralization reaction, as it says here, um, where we can uh, have an acid, add a base to it, and it'll end up becoming something that's neutral, uh, which would be a salt and, and water. So titration um, really tells us a point where equilibrium is reached, uh, and we call that the equivalence point. And as I said in my little demonstration there, or my little explanation a couple seconds ago, uh, it is that point where we have, an ex have added exactly the 
correct number of moles of an acid or a base material to neutralize the solution into a water and a salt. So it's a it's a it's a, chemi a chemistry process. Um, so really, it's background theory for us. Okay, the equivalence point can be found two ways uh, through color changing pH indicators, and we saw in the video an example of litmus paper, which is one of these color changing pH indicators, or through pH measurements. And this is what would uh, we would discover uh, if we did the, the titration lab. But it looks something. Uh, uh, like the next slide, not this slide. So here's the pH indicators. Uh, again, these are dyes that change color at set values depending on their pH value. Um, so I don't expect you to know it, any of these or all of these for that matter, um, but just to know that there are different uh, indicators based on different levels of the pH uh, range. And you can buy strips that have uh, one of these or all of them uh, together. Um, you can use these strips, I guess, to verify a pH uh, transmitter as well uh, as a nice, easy practice. Uh, you know, you can carry them, carry them in your pocket, uh, dip it in the process, hold it, hold it up to the scale and, and verify the analyzer uh, kind of that way. So they are semi-useful. Okay, pH measurements here, and this is talking about the equivalence point and titration. Uh, and we've seen this curve before, it represents uh, the nonlinearity uh, that's associated with the pH scale and how each step in pH is a thousand times uh, greater than the previous one and how we can add a bunch uh, for a long time and then all of a sudden we get a great big kit. Um, this is due to that logarithmic property of pH, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you see, basically, if we add a volume of a base to an acid, so we're trying to find out what type of an acid uh, we have we don't know the strength of it but we do know the strength of our base so we can add our base in milliliters uh, a little bit at a time a little bit at a time a little bit at a time until we get this kick here at this equivalence point uh, the equivalence point in this case is just over 10 milliliters it represents a ph of seven which is neutral or that's why we call it equivalent point and um, if we know the molarity of our base solution and we know the number of milliliters, uh, we can calculate the pOH. And then from that, we can then also determine the pH. And that's a really long drawn out exercise um, that demonstrates the theory behind uh, pH and, and the relationship between hydronium and hydroxide. Here's a whole bunch of videos. I'm not going to make you watch them all right now, but if you have any uh, questions about the things moving forward. These refer to the next uh, couple of topics, um, but these are all uh, pretty good, interesting videos here. Uh, crash, crash Course is that annoying guy we just watched, um, but these are all uh, good for one thing or another, so I've included them here in the presentation, but we're not going to watch them right now. Um, but if you do have questions, chances are you'll be able to find an answer in there. Okay, this leads us into the most challenging part about this particular ILM, uh, and this is oxidation and reduction reactions. So we talked about oxidation numbers earlier. Uh, there is a bunch of rules that were attached to oxidation numbers. Um, you're going to have to go back into your memory banks and, and remember them. Uh, I've included them in the presentation here, so uh, i help you refresh them. Um, but we're going to talk about specifically what do those numbers mean in terms of these ions uh, moving back and forth in a reaction. So in some chemical reactions, electrons will move from one reactant to another. The number lost by one is always the same as the number gained by the other. And this goes into some Dalton's rules of this and that and the other where things are never destroyed, they're just changed. Uh, if there's any swapping, it happens simultaneously, so very, very fast. And when it does that, and these ions exchange uh, between different uh, parts of the reaction, it's called an oxidation or a reduction reaction. So specifically, oxidation, and this is not really intuitive, it's kind of backwards. Oxidation doesn't really have anything to do specifically with oxygen. That's the first thing that you've got to get out of your head. Um, oxidation is a chemical change that results in a reactant losing electrons. So oxidation, losing electrons. Reduction is a change that results in a reactant gaining electrons. Okay, so reduction, gaining, 
oxidation losing don't worry uh, there's an easy way for us to remember that is this uh, loss of electrons is oxidation or leo says ger okay so loss of oxidation loss of electrons is oxidation gaining of electrons is a reduction so if you like that one that works good uh, another one that works good is oil rig so oxidation is loss reduction is gain uh, very important there's uh, quite a few questions i think on this oxidation reduction stuff all right so here are all these rules now you may or may not have to refer back to these most of them are irrelevant for the context of this course um this list of rules kind of is meant to cover probably uh higher level chemistry courses than uh, than we uh have to worry about um the ones that i don't think there's any examples of i've put not a concern for us here so don't worry about it um, most of these rules we've addressed earlier when we talked about oxidation numbers so simple ones uh, an atom in its elemental state has an oxidation number of zero so for example uh, cu by itself would have a number of zero uh, same thing for a monatomic ion uh, again cu positive would uh, have a number equal to its charge so so one or whatever it happens to be um and then the oxidation numbers for other things are assigned according to the following rules uh, we basically use the first couple here so group 1a and group 2a are plus one and plus two they were plus one and plus two last time we talked about this they still are so nothing changes there oxygen in a compound has an oxidation number of minus two same as we discussed earlier nothing changes there uh, a couple of other rules that i don't believe uh, we have to worry about but if you run into a question like this there is a rule for that uh, that rules four and five we've also covered before uh, the sum of oxidation numbers of elements in a compound is equal to zero um, we'll we reinforce that in the example here uh, and the sum of oxidation numbers of elements in a polyatomic ion equals the charge on that ion and again these are both rules that we've uh, exercised before all right so what does that mean uh, hang on this is fun okay so oxidation numbers relate to the number of electrons on each atom they can be negative positive or zero some oxidation numbers never change these are the ones that we're probably going to be addressing mostly in the ilm so again elements in group 1a and 2a there's rules for that oxygen there's a rule for that polyatomic ions there's a rule for that so here this kind of uh, wraps it all up in here so the exercise that we're going to be doing moving forward is going to look just like this our goal is to determine we have products over here assign the oxidation number to uh, each of the elements in the product side or sorry in the reactant side and then have a reaction occur have our products form and then reassign oxidation numbers based on what has occurred so applying the rules to this first version here uh, an element by itself whether it's an ion or not uh, if it's by itself oxidation number is zero okay elements in a compound as we have here the oxidation number uh, of a polyatomic uh, ion stays the same as it would normally be in SO4, uh, I believe is uh, two negative. Um, and copper is, uh, we're not 100% sure what copper is. Copper in this case is uh, got to be two positive because together in a compound, it's got to be zero. There's a rule for that. So copper in this case is two positive. If we have the reaction, then what happens? We get our single replacement reactions and changes places with copper and we end up with copper sulfate. So what ends up happening uh, as this goes on here, the zinc, what the hell is happening here? Why am I having the, what the hell is going on here? I'm having a brain fart. Uh, 
something goofy happened here. This is a bad example. Wait, is this the same example that's in the IOM? I'm going to have to check this. This doesn't look great to me. Yeah, it doesn't look right. Okay, let's stop stop me talking about this because there's no way that this, there's no crisscrossing here. So something bad happened in this image. Let's look at the next one here. Here's the, here's the proper explanation for the wrong image. So this represents the, the example in the ILM and this is what should have happened. So zinc uh, by itself has an oxidation number of zero. Uh, copper sulfate here, the sulfate, uh, oxidation number doesn't change from the ion table, it's minus two. And overall, this has to be zero. Polyatomic uh, compounds have to have a zero. So in order, if this is minus two, then the copper must be plus two. That's what I got here. The plus two for plus two for the copper, minus two for the sulfate. Then we have a reaction. You see here finally we get our crisscrossy or single replacement. That leaves copper now by itself. So it gets an oxidation number of zero on this side, zinc on this side now, because the uh, sulfate never changes according to a rule, it's minus two. In order to make zero as a compound, the zinc has to be plus two. So what happened is what we're looking for. So zinc was a zero over here, and now it's a two. So if it went from a zero to a plus two, it must have lost electrons. Right, it got more positive, so loss of electrons. So loss of electrons means that it was oxidized. So in this case, we would say that zinc became oxidized. Now copper was a plus two over here, and now it's a zero over here. So in order to go from a plus two to a zero, it had to gain electrons, two of them. So it gained electrons, so gaining of electrons is reduced. So the zinc was oxidized, the copper was reduced. So I hope that doesn't blow you away too much. Uh, there's a couple of examples in here uh, that it can be a little bit overwhelming to look at at first, um, but hopefully it's not going to be too bad. Okay, here's a little bit more complicated one. The way I've got it laid out here is probably a little bit messy, uh, but we're figuring out the oxidation numbers for each of these groups. Um, as we go through. So I'll start, this group is here, this group is here, uh, this group is here, this group is here, and so on and so forth. So looking at the first one here, um, I have three hydroxides, which is a polyatomic ion, and it's got a negative charge. So three times negative one means negative three. Therefore, Bi has to be positive three to make this overall a zero. Second one here, I have two times the positive one for potassium because potassium is in group 1A, so it keeps its charge of plus one, and I have two of them, so therefore it's plus two. Oxygen has a rule, which is oxygen is always minus two, and I've got two of them, so that means minus four. I don't know what tin is, but I can tell what tin is if I know what this is and I know what this is. So I have uh, minus four from the oxygens plus the plus two from the potassium, which leaves me overall with the negative two. Therefore, in order to make this overall a zero, the tin component is plus two. So I'll add that down there. Uh, oxidation number for Bi, it's by itself, so it's zero. And this one again here is potassium times two, so plus two. Oxygen, uh, three times minus two is six. Negative six, so negative six and plus two is negative four. So tin in this case is positive four in order to make this overall zero. Uh, and then we have oxygen. Uh, one oxygen is minus two. Two hydrogens is uh, two times plus one, so plus two. And here's what all of that looks like laid out here. So on this side, Bi is plus three. This is minus three. This is plus two. This is plus two. This is minus four. This is zero. This is plus two. This is plus four. This is minus six. This is plus two. And this is minus two. It's a long exercise. 
but it is not too bad once you do a few of them. So final step after you do all of this torturous uh, oxidation number assignment is finding out what has changed. So here we have tin going from a plus two on this side to a plus four on this side. So it has lost electrons or became more positive. So loss of electrons means it was oxidized. So tin was oxidized. Bi was a plus three on this side and it's a zero on this side. So we had obviously gained three electrons in order to get to be zero gaining of electrons is reduced. So the questions are gonna ask you, in this reaction, which element was oxidized, which element was reduced? And that's how we do that. This leads us into objective six, the last objective in uh, this ILM. And this talks about how electrochemical cells um, work. And I'm just going to hit on it kind of very um, lightly, uh, but not too light, and but not too heavy either. Okay, so long story short, when chemicals in a battery react, electrical energy is created. That's how batteries work. They're made out of a couple of chemicals that are slowly reacting and giving off electrical energy. This is the basis of what we call electrochemistry, chemistry, which is one of our uh, studies here in third year. So we're going to discuss two types of electrochemical cells. The first one is a galvanic cell, which acts like a battery, meaning that it creates electricity on its own based on the chemical reaction. And the second type is an electrolytic type of a cell, which is basically the opposite uh, of the galvanic cell. It's more similar to a plating process where we introduce current to it in order to push uh, the electrode uh, electrons uh, from one electrode through the electrolyte to another electrode. So representing them graphically, a galvanic cell um, generates electricity or electrons based on the chemical reaction that's happening in here, whereas an electrolytic cell requires electricity to be provided for it in order to kind of uh, induce this flow of electrons from uh, electrode to electrode. Okay, uh, galvanic cells here, and uh, all I'm gonna tell you is that you need to be able to distinguish from an image what type of cell it is. Uh, you should have a kind of rough idea of what happens in terms of uh, anodes and cathodes and negative and positive. Um, don't worry about these formulas here. I don't make you do any of them, um, but this does explain uh, what happens as these um, electrons are moving uh, from one electrode through this membrane to uh, the other electrode. So galvanic cells convert chemical energy into electrical energy. That's a bare minimum, you have to know that. They produce electricity in an oxidation and reduction reaction, and reduction occurs at the cathode. Highlight this in your ILM. Okay, reduction, cathode, that's it. Electrolytic cells, totally different, okay? Lots of things going on here, but first here we have a lab power user, not a power generator. We have flow going from anode to cathode over here. We have reduction occurring at the cathode. Here, electrolytic cells convert electrical energy into chemical energy. So we have uh, a, a battery or a power source here. The process is a reverse of a galvanic cell. Reduction, again, uh, happens at, uh, at the cathode over here, but you see the electron flow is going from anode uh, to cathode, the opposite of the galvanic cell. There's a lot more theory to it than this, uh, than uh, that is actually in the ILM. It's a, it's a decent read, um, but I don't believe that it's gonna change your life as an instrument technician. Um, 
so the general idea is kind of uh, I think this is adequate enough for our purposes um, let's see what goes on here electrolytic cells in general here oxidation always occurs at the uh, anode and reduction always occurs at the cathode that's probably worth uh, worth highlighting as well. Here, copper loses electrode, uh, electrons and is oxidized. So the copper breaks down into a positive copper ion when it gives away two electrons, uh, electrons. So loss of electrons, again, it is being oxidized. And the zinc gains electrons and is reduced. So this is, uh, this is how that oxidation reduction ties into our electrochemical cells. That is the end of what is pretty painless, except for the last maybe objective five. Um, but that should reinforce some of the stuff we talked about in analyzers. Have a good day.